so glad to have everyone here tonight as we get into our study of James chapter 4. I pray that everyone's enjoying this. I know I am. And I was sitting here thinking today as I was preparing and praying and preparing and praying and looking at this. You know, the more we get to looking at the Word of God and studying the Word of God, the more important that we realize that it is and the significance that it is that we live a life that is pleasing to God and, you know, put forth every effort that we can to please Him. Let's go to prayer before we begin tonight. Our great God of heaven, we love you. We thank you for this day, for your many blessings. We pray, Lord God of heaven, as we come to you tonight, Lord of heaven, as we break the bread of life, that you would feed us with manna from heaven. Lord of heaven, help us to open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive. And pray, Lord God of heaven, a very special grace and a very special morning of the Holy Spirit tonight to, to touch us, that we can leave this place knowing we've been in your presence and knowing, Lord of heaven, that you have visited with us. Lord God of heaven, help me. Give me the words to speak and the things to say in a way, Lord God of heaven, as if you yourself were speaking to these people. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to go back to verse 1 tonight. We left off here last week, and I looked at this last week as we touched on it from the uh, mindset of having difficulties in relationships with other people as it talked about the wars and fighting among you, dealing with other people. We talked about this for just a little bit last week. But tonight we want to look at this from just a little different perspective. And that's the, 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 the wonderful thing about God's Word is, you know, every time you read it, you can get something different from it, but it all applies. It's all tied together and it's all applicable to whatever we're going through in our life. You know, I like the book of James, and uh, I've always looked at the book of James as Christianity 101, just kind of basic foundation Christian doctrine and, and Christian living and things that we need to live a life pleasing to the Lord this day. Now, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 4, it uh, builds on what chapter 3 left off of, which was James speaking of the self-seeking wisdom of the world. As he says, from where it comes wars and fightings among you, come they not hence even of your lust with that war in your members. The sad fact is, of life is that there are going to be what is worded here as wars and fightings. There are going to be difficulties in relationships that we're going to have in the Christian life, despite how hard we try to go against it, but they're still going to be there. There's going to be, you know, family friction and tension and, and, and squabbles. There's going to be, you know, among friends, sometimes there's going to be issues that are going to be there. On the workplace, there's sometimes there's issues there. But one of the real struggles that we face in Christian living is the warfare within ourselves. The struggle that we have within us. And that's one of the things that this, refer this verse can reference to is where it comes the fighting and the warfare and the struggle that we have because we understand that we're flesh, that we're human. But we're trying to serve a God that is spirit. And his spirit and our flesh oftentimes clash. Why do they clash? Why is there a conflict? Where is, why, what, you know, how can we define the, 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 the reason for the warfare? And it's because of our desires. James says they come from our own lust or our own desires, our wants, our will, what we want. And most of us as people 
are strong willed. We are determined. When we want something, we want it now. And when we want something, we want it how we want it, when we want it, and all the things that can be said about that. But sometimes what we want and what God wants for us can be two different things. You know, spiritual warfare that goes on in the heart of a believer, and every believer has it to some degree. No believer is exempt. Some have, have grown and matured enough in faith that they might not struggle with some issues as much as maybe they did when they first got saved and first started living for the Lord. And prayerfully we all, and hopefully we all can grow and develop and mature to that place. But still we're going to have things that we're going to struggle with. Still we're going to have issues that are going to uh, be difficult for us at times. Romans chapter 7, uh, the Lord uses Paul to write to this epistle and he, he kind of talks about it, uh, uh, how that living the Christian way and trying to live for the Lord and, and, and the, spirit, the Spirit of God and the nature of man collide. It's called the sin nature. Some have defined it and, and referred to it. And it's a little teaching that goes there that goes back to the original sin of Adam that fell in one of these days. God forbid it, we'll look a little, a little deeper into that. But things that we want, things that we desire, can be so strong. See, for a lot of people, they have a strong desire to accumulate material possessions. Nothing wrong with that. A lot of people have a strong desire for prestige. They have notoriety. They want to be world-renowned. They want to be well-known. And there's nothing wrong with a person wanting to excel. There's nothing wrong with it. Others crave pleasures for gratifact, gratification of their, of, of their flesh. Things that make them feel good. Things that make them, you know, make them have that warm, fuzzy feeling all over. Things that, uh, uh, this, is one of the, this is one of the issues that we have today with alcoholism and drug addiction and some of the other things that are so that are so strong in our culture is because people are looking for something to feed the flesh, make the flesh feel good. Give them, you know, that warm, fuzzy feeling all over. Now, the thing about these things are while there's nothing wrong with a, a material possession and there's nothing wrong with being, you know, well-known and you know, notoriety of things, as long as they do not interfere with what God's plan for our life is and we do not... We do not allow our ways and means of obtaining these things interfere with our relationship with the Lord. There are powerful forces that are at work around us that are trying to persuade us, that are trying to influence us, that are trying to encourage us sometimes to go the wrong direction. And, you know... <laughs> I don't know if any of you ever had this problem growing up, but you always seem to have one standing off the side and say, come on, it ain't going to hurt. You know, they'll never know about it. What's it going to hurt? Let's go ahead and skip school today. Who's going to know? You know, let's go ahead and do this. They'll never know. Let's go ahead and do that. They'll never know. There's always, and it's the same thing going on today. There's always that spirit that's at work around us that's trying to coax us, that's trying to tempt us, that's trying to convince us that it's all right to do wrong. And at the same time, while this is going on, and while, man, you know, look, just, 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 it's kind of like when the serpent was tempting Eve in the garden. Man, look at that tree. Look how beautiful it is. Look at the fruit. See how good it looks. And Eve began to look at the forbidden fruit, and, 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 and her perspective began to change, and her thinking began to change and her her and where it didn't used to bother her at all at one time now suddenly well i just wonder what it would taste like well i just wonder if i do partake of this fruit that well i become as wise as god so then she began to talk with adam and her and adam you know they begin to and, it, and these are some of the, the the forces of evil that are at work around us 
And sometimes not only are they at work against us, sometimes our own flesh and our own desires and our own strong will play into this too. And these things many times are contrary to the word of God. Now, I've got a news alert tonight. I've got some late breaking, shocking news for society today. You don't hear much about this anymore. You don't hear it taught. You don't hear it preached. It's not sung about. But it is still important that we please God. It is still a number one priority to please God. You know, there was a time where there was a strong emphasis in our nation to please God. We were known as one nation under God. Now they're wanting to change that. Well, they're wanting to take God out of, out of the equation. I pray that it never happens. There is a priority in our life that God is supposed to be first. For those of us who are married, it is supposed to be God first, spouse second, children and family third, then church, work, and so on down, down the line. But first and foremost, God has to be first. My wife and I had this discussion when we first started dating, and we, we had this agreement when we first started dating. You know, I'm not saying that that time would ever come, but we both have, you know, we talked about it, and we feel very strongly and passionately about it. Should it ever, the situation ever arise, that I have to make a choice between God or my wife, I'm going to choose God. But at the same time, my wife feels the same way. If there ever was to come a time in our relationship to where she has to make a choice between me or God, she's going to choose God. It is important today, still important. It is and the thing that I have a heaviness in my heart about, I, I, I just got to share this with you for just a moment because there is something that my heart grieves about. I walk the floors, and, and I walk when I pray, and I walk the floors and I pray about it because there is a sense today that people just seem to work. They don't care if they please God or not. They don't care. And sometimes for even with, with, with those who want to profess Christianity, it appears that they don't really care whether they please God or not. But it is important that we still live a life that pleases God. James goes on to say in verse 2 that we lust and we have not. We kill and we desire to have and cannot attain. We fight and we war, yet we have not because we ask not. He says in verse 3 that we ask and receive not because we ask amiss, that we may consume it upon our own lust. These two verses stand out as to why sometimes our prayers go unanswered. People will tell you, you know, God don't answer prayers. That's wrong. God answers prayers. He is still in the prayer answering business today. But it is sometimes what we pray and how we pray them that will determine as to whether we give an answer or not. And these verses tie in together on that. Sometimes our prayers go unanswered because we don't pray the right way. I had to learn very early in my Christian experience that you know, God will never grant a prayer that is prayed against his word. When I was very young and, and, and very young in the Lord, I thought you could pray for anything. You know, you could you could ask him in the word and it's, you know, and, 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 and you could say, well, yeah, I can. And I, my heart was right and, my, you know, and there's some things that my, my, my motives were probably right, but the way I was thinking in my mind because I was young and immature and the Lord, the Lord couldn't answer that because it went against his word. 
And as I began to grow and develop and mature and come to a greater understanding of the word and, and, and the nature and the character of God, I began to understand this. He says in the first part of verse 2 that we have not, or that we, we lust and we have not. This speaks to the fact that sometimes we want something and we want what we want and not what God wants for us. We've read in the Word, and you've heard me talk about this, and I preach from this quite often, how that God has a plan for our life. He has a purpose for our life. And we're just not out here going through the motions and, you know, living life, at, you know, on the whim. If we are walking with Christ and we're, 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 we're following Him, He's leading us in paths of righteousness for His name's sake according to his word and he has a will and he has a plan for our life and he 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 does not and will not go outside of that sometimes maybe what we're praying is the right thing but we um it's we want it more than we want god it doesn't have god doesn't have the priority over that thing in our lives and that he won't he won't answer it because it's not in the proper perspective. And God's not going to give us something that he knows will deliberately pull us away from him. Something that will get it, like you said, something that will interfere with our relationship with him. Well, sometimes it might be that we love that thing more than we would love God and it could draw us That's away. It. Or it could, you know, That's it. have ne negative impacts in our life. Exactly. But maybe we're not mature enough to handle it. Yeah, so sometimes. Most of us aren't millionaires. We couldn't handle it. Exactly. Some people, you know, while it's not a sin for people to have material possessions, a lot of material possessions, I guess you'd say, some people couldn't handle a lot of material possessions because their heart would turn from God rather than turn to God. That could cause them to become prideful and haughty and arrogant. And they begin to seek things more than they seek God. You see it. And love their play, their their treasures more than they love God. Sometimes our desires and what we want can be so strong that we actually pray against the Word of God, and we actually ask for things that are contrary to the Word. Now, not only that, he says in the latter part of that verse. He says, at first, if we lust and we have not, he goes on to say, we kill and desire to have. This speaks of the measures that we will often go to to achieve the desires of our heart. Just what we're talking about to kill. That's going to the extremes. And sometimes if we want something bad enough, we'll to, to torn the expression, I'll do whatever it takes to get it. Anybody ever said that? Anybody ever felt that way? I want what I want, and I'll do whatever it takes to get it. And while that has a nice sound to it, it can be very dangerous when we go to the extremes and we leave God out of the equation. Because if what we want doesn't line up with God's will and God's word, then we better leave it alone. We almost remember that God will never give us anything that goes against his word. And this is something I keep saying this over and over again, but I, but I say it for a reason. is because it's something that, that, that I feel a, an unction of the Holy Spirit to get this in our heart. He says in verse 3 that we ask and receive not because we ask amiss, that we may consume it upon our own lust. Once again, this is often a result of un the unanswered prayer and people want to blame God for not answering their prayer. That's one of the reasons why people tell you, well, the days of miracles are over. No, they're not. Days of miracles are, are not over. They, God is still performing miracles daily. God is still healing people daily. God is still <laughs> delivering people from bondage and sin <laughs> Daily, God is still doing a work around this world. He's still providing for the needs of people daily. God is still a prayer answering miracle working God. And just because 
we may be praying the wrong way with the wrong heart, the wrong intent, or, or something may be amiss in, 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 in us, don't blame God because God is still God and God is still working. Well, it's kind of like um, people praying for a, a spouse and are not equally yoked and they pursue it and ended up end up with a life of regret. Mm -hmm. um, also, when we ask, uh, that's asking amiss, and then when we consume it upon our lust, it's kind of like that guy that went out and his barns were full, and he said, well, I'll just go build bigger barns, meaning I'll build bigger and so I can put more stuff in it. Yeah. That's consuming it upon your lust. Mm -hmm. That's it. Exactly. And you know, what you had said about the, the, <coughs> marriage that's one thing the church has fallen way short of down through the years is didn't want to offend people didn't want to get in their business or whatever the reasons were behind it but they did not discourage believers from becoming emotionally attached falling in love and marrying someone that was a non-believer and it has caused much heartache and much trouble and much problems in many homes down through the years because the bible talked about you know being equally yoked and talked about how can two walk together unless they agree and you know there's so many things there that, and that's just because oh I seen that girl and she's gorgeous. I'm gonna go with well, she don't even like God. She don't even love God. She don't want anything to do with God. And here I am a believer. Here I before I met Jackie, I had I was single, was pastoring, and there was opportunities that I had to date and go out with different people and things like that. I chose not to. Because I knew in my heart what I was looking for. I knew in my heart what, what I wanted for somebody to spend the rest of my life with. And I could be in a room with someone five minutes and listen to their conversation and see how they conducted themselves, how they handled themselves. And that would let me know real quick, I didn't want anything to do with them. Um, you know, people use the wrong measuring stick when they when they're looking. People not using you, godly principles and his standards. Well, it's like I said a moment ago about the, about one of the conversations we had when we first started dating about pleasing God. We were in agreement with this from day one. We had been in total agreement with this, and this is one of the things that God put us together because our hearts were the same. Our hearts were one, and. It's like even today, you know, or talking this afternoon when she was driving home, was on the phone with her, I was talking to her, and I mentioned something. I said, you know something, this particular thing has been on my heart very strong for the last few days. She said, mine too. I've been feeling the same thing too. I've been thinking the same thing too. She never knows what I'm going to preach on Sunday morning. But time after time after time again, the music that she plays and sings as she leads praise and worship goes right along with what God has given. She never knows what she, you know, different things like this of, of what I'm going to do I, because that's how we work. But the Lord uses both of us. And that's what it's about being equally yoked together. And you're one in the spirit. You both believe God and have the same desires toward God. That's it. And someone who does not, you're not equally yoked with them. And it can cause. And, and that's pull, what, they'll pull one direction and you'll pull another. That's why so many times you know, when it comes to something like this, and that's a perfect example of how we can pray and we can ask God. And I keep thinking of Samson. It just keeps going over my mind over about Samson. Samson, one of the judges of Israel in the Old Testament, 
And he saw a woman down here that was a Philistine. And he told his father, he said, go get her for me because she pleases me. The Philistines were the enemies, the arch enemies of Israel. But he saw this good looking woman over here and he, he didn't care about it. That. He just wanted to fulfill the lust of his flesh. And it caused him problems. It caused him difficulties. And so many times we find ourselves not just not only in marriage, but in a lot of other areas of our life as well. Well, you consider business partners. Exactly. You know, how can you be in business when one may want to handle things a little... Uh, a believer wants to go straight and narrow, and he wants to do things the right way, and he wants to make sure all the business dealings are above board. And, exactly. And, and this, but you got a non-believer that may, he like, might want to do things over here in the shadows and in the dark and deal with the mafia, you know? So that's why it's important. Um, the Lord, one day, his disciples went to him and asked him a question. So teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Talk about John the Baptist. So Jesus sat down with them and he began and he taught them to pray the Lord's Prayer. And us, when I'm talking about the Lord's Prayer, I'm not saying that we should, we should pray this word exactly every time we pray. But there's a foundation, there's a structure there that should be the, the, the basis and the foundation of our prayer life. But he, you know, he goes on by beginning with praise. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Giving God praise and giving God honor, giving God glory. Then it goes on to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And that's the, the part that I want to focus on right now is I had to learn. I had to learn to pray and I still do. Thy will be done. Not what I want, but what you want. Not what I want, Lord God, but because I'm strong willed. I am very strong willed. And I can be determined. But sometimes my strong will and my determination can get me in trouble with God because what I want may not be what God wants at that time. Or it may not be what God wants at all. For my life. Get you in trouble with other people too. It can, very quickly. He says in verse 4, You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of this world is in enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Wow, that's strong. When he talks about the adulterers and adulteresses, we look at the Old Testament scripture and the people of God were often referred to as the wife of the Lord. New Testament scripture, the people, the followers of Christ are often referred to as the bride of Christ. Now, the language of biblical marriage is sometimes often used as an analogy to liken our relationship, like I just said, to that of the husband and wife. So when James is speaking of adulterers and adulteresses here, he's speaking of those who are unfaithful. Spiritually speaking, they were unfaithful. Can I tell you that the Bible is very plain and the Bible is very explicit when it comes to things like adultery and fornication. That no person that not let me let me let me make this perfectly clear. If it was something in the past and I've prayed about it, and I've asked the Lord to forgive me of it, and it's in the past, it's gone. Amen. It doesn't exist. Amen. It's not there. God has forgiven, he's forgotten, he's, it's not there. It never happened in the sight of God. But what he is talking about, oftentimes in New Testament Scripture, is those that are continuing in these activities today. It is a continual lifestyle today. Not only, and we understand that adultery is the thing that happens when you have a man and a woman come together and they're married 
and one of them becomes unfaithful. They began to break the covenant of marriage. We also know that fornication is when two people come together without the benefit of being married. They don't want the responsibility of marriage. They don't want the, the commitment of marriage. They just want the pleasure and the enjoyment that goes with it. Well, not only are these things physically there, but there is a spiritual adultery as well. That is basically the same thing is when we, the bride of Christ, become unfaithful to Christ. We are committing spiritual adultery. In the language of marital language that was used in the New Testament, Jesus being the bridegroom, we being the bride, and once we become to understand more about the culture of the Jewish uh, wedding in the days of Christ, whenever this was written, we understand that the man and woman, the young, they would come together. There would be an engagement that would take place. Now, their engagement ceremony was a whole lot like our wedding ceremony today. And once they were engaged, it was a legal and binding I don't want to use the word contract, but it, that's kind of basically what it was. It was it, it, Once they become engaged, it was as if they were already married. And the husband then, the bridegroom, he would leave his wife most of the time at her father's house. He would go back to his father's house and prepare a place for them to live. And then when he prepared the place and it was prepared to his father's satisfaction, he would then go back, get the bridegroom, or get his bride. They would have the, uh, the cer short ceremony there then, and then they would consummate the, the relationship and so forth. But in his absence, after the engagement, after the betrothal and the engagement took place, and he was gone. She still had to conduct herself as though she was married. Even though, she, you know, technically she might not have been married. She was engaged to this man. She was exposed, exposed to him. And she had to conduct herself as one that was already married under penalty of death if she didn't follow through with it. As believers, we are supposed to be the chaste virgin that Paul references in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. When we're talking about a chaste virgin, when Paul speaks of a virgin, us as the church as virgins, he's referring to our justified cleanliness our, sanct our, our holiness, our purity that we receive at salvation. Because when we come to Christ and we ask the Lord to forgive us and he, he does just that and he forgives us of all of our sin, he puts it on the blood, he puts it aside, it never happens. Once he, and we are as pure and holy and clean as a newborn baby, just as if we had never sinned. We had never, never done anything wrong at all. We become as a virgin, pure. The chaste virgin speaks of us, the, the, the church, the virgins, as a, 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 a maintaining that, that purity, maintaining that status, which comes through our progressive daily sanctification, which means that we have to daily work and allow the Spirit to work in us and through us to maintain that level of purity. We become adulterers and adulteresses when we become unfaithful to Christ. How do we become unfaithful to Christ? When we become disobedient to the Word. When we become, our hearts become 
to where pleasing the bridegroom no longer is important to us. Spiritual fornication when a person thinks that they can enjoy the benefits of Christianity without any commitment to Christ. I can have the favor of God. I can have the blessings of God. I can have the things of God just like everyone else does. But I don't have to. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to read my Bible. I don't have to pray. I don't have to. I can live any old way I want to and still have the blessings of Christ. Wrong. A lot of people fall into one of these two categories. See, there are many today that claim to be engaged to Christ. They, they claim Christianity, but they still want to flirt and, make, and mix and mangle in the world. They still want to run with the boys and run with the girls and do things like they did before they were saved. Can't do that. And there are those who want the intimate benefits. They want all the, the, the perks. They want all the things that come. And, and, and sadly enough, many of them think that they're going to go to heaven. This is the sad thing. But they refuse to make any commitment to Christ. They refuse to, to, to come to a place of salvation on God's terms. And through Christ. I want to tell you, no man comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. That's all. That's it. And we begin to look at, he talks about how that the friendship of this world is the enemy of God. What does it mean to be a friend of this world? As believers, we are to be in this world, but we are not to be of this world. And there is a big difference. Yes. To be of this world means to be comfortable with the world system. What do I mean by the world system? You look at many of the programs in our culture today. You look at much of the politics in our culture today. You look at the agenda that's obvious that's in our culture today. It's the standards and the morals. And the standards and the morals that's in our culture today. And it stands in direct opposition to the Word of God. Amen. In direct opposition to the Word of God. I was in a conversation with, 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 with someone a couple of days ago, last week as a matter of fact, and, and I told him, I said, you know, I said, it's a shame when so many of our government policies and so many of our government programs and so much of our government does things that condones immoral living and an immoral lifestyle. Yes. And our government's right behind it, pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, and promoting it. And what's even worse is there are so many people today that claiming to be Christ-like, claiming to be Christian, that are that are that are in bed with these programs. They 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 they're partaking of these things. They're involved in these things. The hook, line, and sinker. I mean, up to their head in, in these things. And they go against the word of God. And you can't do that. To be a friend with this world, to the world systems, to be partakers of the world systems. Is enmity with God. Oh, I could go, I could give you a list of things right off the top of my head that long. Programs and politics and the agenda and the morality of this culture that we live in that people are jumping on board because it's comfortable to them. Because it, 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 it pleases it because it makes their life Easy in some ways, and because it, because it is, it, it, you know, and because of this, they jump into it. I don't know about you, but I want to please God. 
My heart's desire is one day I'm going to stand in the presence of God. And I pray that it's at the judgment seat of Christ that I want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't want to stand before him at the great white throne judgment and hear him say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I know you not. And you cannot be as scripture is plain. And this is one reason why people, probably a lot of people want to shy away from the book of James is because James just puts it out there as plain as it can be. You cannot be partakers. You cannot be a friend to the world and the world system and the things of the world and still be at peace with God. You can't do these things and still live a Christian life. It's no, no, no plainer than that. And it grieves me today that so many want to and so many are trying to. Just because government sanctions it doesn't make it right. Exactly. It's what God says about it. That's it. The government has no authority to justify what God has said is wrong. Amen. The, no person has the authority to justify what God has said is wrong. No organization. No organization. No church, nobody, nothing, nothing, no thing this side of heaven has the authority to go against what God has said is wrong. Well, Ricky, we're seeing it even to the to the churches that are siding with the moral systems of the world. Yes. And calling things right that God has already called an abomination and has already said is sin and the Bible says that what are the shepherds that scatter the flock those that preach lies and an easy gospel that is contrary to what God's word says exactly that no priest no preacher can tell you something is right that God has called wrong I've had people tell me, well, you know, and there's things that are outlined in Scripture that, that say right or wrong, good or bad, whatever. And I've had people tell me, well, I prayed about it and God said it was all right. God never makes special provisions for anybody. He won't go against his He has word. one standard. That one standard is his word. Amen. And he expects all humanity and all mankind to live and do our best to live according to his word. He, he tells us to pursue holiness without which no man will see the Lord. Exactly. Meaning we have to go after it. We have and, to try to attain it. And they may not blush at sin now, but when they stand before God. Yes, they will. They will. Keep in mind that one day every when they day. Face is, a, when they face a holy God. Yeah. They will be ashamed of their exactly. sins that it's too late. One day every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord. Look at our next verse. It's quarter till. Well, I'll stop here then. I don't want to, I'll stop here. I won't go any farther because I don't want to get halfway into this and stop. But this thing called Christianity is serious. Living for God is serious. Living without God is serious. There is, and we don't hear it talked about much anymore, but my friend, let me tell you, there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. That make no mistake about it. Eternity is real and eternity is long. And what we do in this life will determine where we spend eternity. Amen. And how we live and how we treat the things of God and how we respond to God in this life is going to determine how and how and when we spend eternity. Precious Lord God of heaven, we love you. We thank you for this day.